Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to Starbase, Texas. Today, we're going inside Starbase with the ultimate tour guide, Elon Musk. He's gonna take us through the high bay to see where starships are assembled. We'll also see the new mega bay under construction and talk about SpaceX's plans to get this rocket flying. Now, I must warn you, some of the things we talk about are pretty technical, but I've got a handful of videos to help you understand what we're talking about. There's links in the description to those videos. And stick around, because in the next videos, we're going to go up the launch tower, then we'll see the new Raptor 2s up close and personal, and talk about the Falcon 9's Merlin engine in great detail. And if you happen to find this video valuable, consider dropping a super thanks as a tip, or become a channel member or a Patreon supporter for early access and to help show your support. All right, let's get started. So we're making, we're making good progress with the, the mega bay over there. So that should be done in a month or so. That's tricky to scale from, because perspective wise right here, it almost looks the same, you know, <laughs> just from our perspective, but it's, it's about uh, 30, 40 feet uh, taller. Okay. So it's, it's more about uh, uh, just, uh, <laughs> You know, in this case, uh, girth is more important than length uh, because we, we just need we need to be able to uh, construct more ships and boosters. Yeah. And you can see, like, like the the high bay there is it's okay if you've got like maybe uh, two or three uh, works in progress, uh, but like or you, like like maybe have two or three workstations in 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 this uh, in the high bay. In the mega bay, we, we can have um, like really almost a dozen, uh, maybe at least 10 workstations. Holy cow. So that's why wow. the sort of width and length are, are more important there. Um, uh, especially as we try to really get the production line going, we need more workstations. Yeah. Um, the high bay here is okay for making, for a low production rate, but as you go to a higher production rate, you need you just need more workstations. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a booster, right? Yeah. Or half a booster, half a half a ship. It looks like. Yeah, exactly. It looks like you do have those uh, your vents there, the cold, the cold gas or the the yeah. ullage gas vents. Yes. Yeah, so, well, well, we're using the ullage gas uh, for uh, attitude control. So instead of having separate attitude control thrusters, we're using the ullage gas uh, itself uh, for attitude or reaction control. Um, so basically for attitude control in um, once you're in orbit, or basically when you're in a vacuum, uh, you, you don't need, you, the impulse needed is very low. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in a, earlier design iterations, we had a separate um, cold gas attitude control system with ni nitrogen bottles, but um, that actually doesn't make a lot of sense since we've got a bunch of ullage that we're gonna vent anyway. Uh, so we might as well use the ullage gas for, um, uh, for, for basically uh, attitude control and small delta V changes in, uh, on orbit. Yeah. Uh, I, I, okay, I, I had to admit, I'm, uh, you taught us to question your constraints. So yeah. uh, that, that makes sense to me for the booster, you know, because the booster doesn't need to do, it basically, the second you turn the engines off, it's going to need to want to vent a lot of its stuff anyway, and that also corresponds with its first flip. But for a starship, like with docking maneuvers and stuff, how does, to me, in my head, the, the Venn diagram of needing to depress uh, a, a tank and the Venn diagram of needing to do a, an orbital maneuver don't always, you know, have a huge amount of overlap. So is, um, or is it not a concern? Can you, are they, is it always going to be on tap? When the um, ship gets to orbit, uh, you, you, you're going to have still a pretty high pressure in the oxygen and fuel tanks. Uh, which are autogenously pressurized. Uh, so you've got uh, hot uh, gaseous oxygen and um, sort of hot methane. Um, and, but you have uh, a lot more um, ullage pressure than, than you, you don't need, you actually don't need um, any, any more ullage pressure. So uh, like you've got more, you've got more pressure than you need. Okay. So, okay. Um, and, and the, the, uh, the deorbit and the landing burns are done with the header tanks. 
So you actually want to vent the main tanks down to just above atmospheric pressure. Well, really, uh, uh, you, you, want, you want to have enough pressure in the main tanks for structural stability. So, so it's like there's, so it's pressure stabilized, uh, but, but not any more pressure than is needed for pressure stabilization for atmospheric entry. Right. Um, and it's going to, but, but, but when it gets to orbit, it's going to have really a lot more pressure than is needed for atmospheric entry. Okay. So we would, we would in any case, end up venting the, uh, the main tanks down to the pressure needed for, for uh, re-entry. Okay. Um, and uh, so we'd be tossing that gas away. Okay. So, so it's, if it's free, you might as well use it. Yeah, we're going to dump the gas anyway. So then, so then why have a, a separate tanks and everything? Um, you might as well use that gas for, um, uh, you know, attitude control and small maneuvers. And, um, and, and then even then, you, we'll still end up uh, uh, dumping the remaining gas that's not needed for en entry. OK, that, so because of that last statement, the, you'll be dumping it anyway, definitely kind of yeah, actually, yeah. when you look at the old design, it actually, it's just like, obviously, we're, it was pretty dumb to have a separate um, a cold gas uh, reaction control system um, because uh, we have excess ullage gas. Um, and if we simply um, have a main tank vents that uh, vent in the direction that you'd want, then there's no need to have uh, separate uh, ullage thrusters. You can literally just use the, the vents. So at some point, those will probably have like almost like an Apollo style, like four four way uh, set of nozzles or something, right? Or because right now they're just facing uh, prograde, basically. Yeah, so, that's those. Th th so that would be for, for settling thrusters, basically the those ones up there. Okay. Um, and there's there's side thrusters that you don't see on right now. Uh, that will be added, so side vents, um, and um, yeah. So I, I, it just still surprises me that they're not doing, uh, you know, like capturing and, and doing some kind of high pressure uh, or higher pressure, you know, hot gas thruster anymore when you have. No, the the hot gas thruster was uh, definitely over engineered uh, and unnecessary. Um, so it, just using ullage gas for. For basically for for small thrust, uh, is uh, the obvious move in this case. Um, so, in, in in retrospect, the obvious move. Uh, it's much more efficient than having separate um, cold gas thrusters. Well, I guess now that now that I think about it, there probably hasn't there's never really been a rocket where the the upper stage or the actual spacecraft is 99% a giant empty tank or a, a yes. drained tank. Every other vehicle, space shuttle, you know, very small amounts of. Yeah you know, just the ohms pods basically and right. that stuff. But there's never really been a vehicle that's on orbit where it just went through a, you know, four or five minute burn. And now it needs to, yeah, that actually is really, really interesting. That's so crazy. So it's, it's, a, it's a significant optimization, mass and cost savings to use the ullage gas for um, attitude and reaction control than to have separate cold gas thrusters. I love it. Um, I'd say that's like one of the biggest improvements that we've made. I gotta admit that was one, when you were talking about the last time and I, I kept thinking about yeah, literally, it. I was actually used, I was just, it was like literally occurred to me in real time. Uh, yeah. It occurred to me while I was explaining it to you. <laughs> I was like, wait, what are we doing? Uh, <laughs> it's, it was one of those things that kept just being like, that can't be right. But you're, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it seems to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we, we kind of went through this exercise for the uh, the ship, and I was like, wait a second, we should do that for the booster as well. And that just occurred to me literally while I was doing the interview <laughs> with you. <laughs> like, okay. Do you mind saying a few things or? or sure. do I, what, what do you think we should I don't discuss? Know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I want to see Elon's interviewing skills. Well, I mean, uh, so, so this is Joe Petrozalka. He's uh, head of, uh, a booster engineering, um, and um, I don't know if <laughs> anything you want to say. Uh, like, 
good point at things and describe. <laughs> what's what's yeah. new on like seven and stuff? What are, what are some of the new things you guys are working on? Uh, on Booster Seven, which is which is down at the pad right now, it's been quite an improvement over the first boosters that we built four and five. Mm -hmm. uh, we simplified a lot of things. Like there was a lot of you just learn when you put things together the first time. We were able to get rid of a lot of it and combine a lot of it. It's got some new arrow features, so it's got upgraded grid fins and it has chines or strikes on the side of yeah. it, and those are going to make the re-entry performance much better, so we'll be able to actually come in at a lower velocity and yeah. get higher precision when we're coming in through the tower catch. So we're really excited to try that out on there. Okay, then I got one for both of you guys. Why Why are the, the strikes or whatever, you, the chi chines? What, chines. chines? Uh, why, why aren't they 180? <laughs> it sounds like wind chimes. Yeah, or like just chimes. Like chimes with an N. Yeah. <laughs> chimes. Uh, why, why, why aren't they 180 degrees to each other? It looks like they're about a 140 or something offset. Yeah, they're about 120 actually. And what they do, it's not about just increasing the, the like wingspan, if you will. It's about getting the area of, of the cylinder of the rocket to pressurize. So those features help the rest of the rocket pressurize. So it's more than just the area of those chimes. You actually get more net drag on that section of the vehicle at, at an angle right at not an angle yeah are. okay so you're so you're basically using that to increase like the overall surface area when it's coming at some kind of angle of attack yeah. and so the booster is very it's very bottom heavy with all of the engines down yep. there and so you're trying to actually add drag area down there as well yep and when you do that that can let the booster pitch up higher yes otherwise if you don't have the chines it wants to just come in Feet first. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. still first. gonna come in pretty butt in first, but <laughs> <in> first, <laughs> a little slightly less. Well, you can pitch it up uh, to ten or twenty degrees. Yeah, you, yeah. And you get yeah. much more control authority. And, and further really and, it, and it's, cross range. I, I, and as, as Joe was saying, it's a little bit more than just increasing the the, the cross section of the of, of the vehicle. Um, you're because you're not trying coming to increase in. The, the, the the integrated pressure uh, profile on the base. Okay. Uh, so uh, you, you've got you've got the the, the sort of uh, the the experienced wind of, of, is, 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 is hitting the cylinder of, of the vehicle and then it's rolling around the cylinder and it's kind of like losing pressure as it rolls as it rolls around yep. um, by having the, the, the chines be uh, not at 180 degrees but a little little lower down we're catching more of that air that's escaping okay. um, and so uh, technically you actually have slightly less cross-sectional area but you have more integrated pressure at the base. Gotcha. Here, uh, let's, let's keep moving quick while this machinery is firing up. So, but, but these, these are very primitive chines. Yeah. We, we knew way better. First attempt, and yeah. I expect to change them yeah. a lot over time. Well, one of the things that I love about it is that you're covering up the COPVs that so it's both to, both a COPV aero cover, yeah. double use out, double of, use out of it, yeah. which I love. I, I I do fear that it makes us less rigorous about getting rid of COPVs. <laughs> uh, but more complacent that they're that they're have a home. as many as we wanted under them so they were still a portion okay, okay good <laughs> um, but like if, if you say like what's what are optimized chines you'd, you'd actually want them to get uh, um, bigger as you get closer. wider at the bottom yeah wider at the bottom they begin to start looking like chip flaps yeah you, yeah you let the simulation run away especially especially as you're coming in like you said with uh, such a big amount of mass and basically a dry can above it you'd really want the center of pressure to be as low as possible right yeah so that brings me to another question then. You're still, I'm curious why you guys are still sticking with uh, with grid fins instead of like a more traditional, you know, stabilator or a, uh, some kind of canard or something, you know? Uh, <laughs> well, this, this is, is a, a frequent topic of conversation. A, exactly, this is, this is a, we discuss this a lot. I mean, essentially, like our optimization right now is getting to orbit. Yeah. Um, so there's, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so, we know how to use grid fins from Falcon 9. Um, grid fins uh, are, are uh, much more consistent than flaps as you go from hypersonic to uh, supersonic to transonic to subsonic. So you're going through these different mock re re regimes yeah. um, and grid fins um, are much more consistent than, than a, a, a wing or a, a, wing, a wingy thing. A wingy, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, especially as you go subsonic, the, the center of pressure on any kind of uh, flat surface uh, shifts significantly uh, where you go from uh, supersonic to subsonic. Um, yep. So, uh, but I, I, you know, could, could you be lighter than a grid fin? Pro I think there's a good chance you could be. Um, th th there's also another factor, which is the, the, the actuator power needed to turn a grid fin is much less than is needed for to turn a wing, a, a, a sort of a wing-like thing. Of similar. 
Yeah, uh, especially as that as that center of pressure changes, uh, it, it increases the torque on the motor, right? Well, you're necessarily yeah, yeah, necessar you're necessarily you're necessarily going to be wrong. Torque is so short that even if the center of pressure changes, yeah. it's not far from the rotation yes. point. And so the total yeah. torque required does not change dramatically throughout your mock regime transitions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we are constantly talking about do we have the right number of grids? Like, like we're they designed correctly. Yes, yeah, so like we we're not saying we're right. right. Uh, to be clear, like we're we're definitely not optimal, optimal, but we uh, uh, it'll work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, like yeah. it's pr probability of it working is good, and it's one less problem to solve. Uh, it's also there's like we obviously don't need four. Uh, like, uh, you, you, I like. Like I think we could probably get away with with two. Definitely not more than three. Well, your old uh, uh, the 2016 like original OG uh, you know ITS had had three, and I remember that being a pretty unique design consideration, you know. And yeah, the sheer number of iterations that this vehicle has gone through <laughs> is insane. Before uh, it even before it even hit the pavement, it had already iterated like <laughs> so yeah. many times. Well, For my sure. I, I started questioning, you know, why. For me, I always thought the grid fin was a lot of it was being able to retract them on ascent, you know, get them out of the wind stream. But now that you're not retracting them, I was like, well, that and then also, you know, the actual mass savings, you know, 50% uh, of your the mass of a grid fin is is perpendicular to your your control motion, you know, your control authority. So I, I always wondered if like they how that would the trade would be on just yeah compared to like a normal wingy thing, you uh, know. If if you know your position well and you know your winds well. Uh, you can, in theory, uh, have a ballistic arc when you do your boost back burn uh, that is very accurate with, right. with nothing. Um, except, uh, uh, what, and we tried this in the early days of Falcon 9. Yeah. Uh, it, which, which, but, but the problem is, like, uh, any small uh, asymmetries on, on the vehicle um, will cause it to. Uh, Go, go crazy basically it'll spin up and, and start flapping around and, and, and it'll, it'll just start oscillating and rotating and uh, dynamic stability becomes a concern yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> so so technically you don't you don't actually need massive surfaces uh, you just need to be able to take out um, the asymmetries of the of, of protuberances on the vehicle um, uh, and, and, and any error that you have uh, with respect to position or your boost back impulse. Yeah, and and even wind conditions and things like that. I'm yeah. sure micro. Yeah. Um, so uh, you really don't. You, you, the control surfaces you need are, are actually not very big, uh, and we've we've shrunk the grid fins significantly from where we started out. The, so um, they're they're much lighter. Um, yeah, but but like. It, uh, even with grid fins, we really should be moving to uh, aspirationally two grid fins, but certainly not more than three. And and the third one can be small. Uh, a little vestigial guy in the. I like just imagining a tiny little guy in on yeah, one really. on one sector. Yeah. Um, so. That's Hi, we have actually this is uh, the liquid oxygen tank section for booster eight. Uh, is coming along very quickly right behind Booster 7 and then the Ship 24 nose cone. So this is the ship that we hope to pair with Booster 7 uh, for our first orbital launch attempt. It's looking so much more refined already than even S20. Oh, uh, can we see the door? The um, on, the, on the back side of it? Corner. Yeah, I mean, it's not gonna blow your mind <laughs> you'd be surprised man the internet sure loves that door yeah you're gonna see the door anyway so <laughs> i guess why not but uh because you're you're at this point planning to launch 24 with starlink version 2 already right yeah uh well uh we'll see uh but Um, I mean, it's just, like I said, it's not going to blow your mind here, you know. <laughs> it's basically, uh, it's like we call it the Pez dispenser. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of like that. It's the, the Starlink satellites are, you know, in, in this 
uh, rack, which looks like a friggin' Pez thing, because <laughs> uh, they're like, you know, kind of like rectangular, just like a Pez, and they're stacked inside the, the, the nose cone, inside the fairing. And um, since, since they're, they're low profile, we only need a really a small door. Um, with a small door, we can use pressure stabilization, like we can retain pressure in, in the fairing, uh, to, so we can uh, at least partially pressure stabilize the uh, the nose cone, oh fairing, gotcha. um, and and then the we don't have a humongous hinge door uh, like, uh, yeah. Like but, you might later on with, yeah, yeah, with larger sure. pieces of cargo and things like that. Yeah, we we can make a giant door in the future, but yeah. this allows it's this a, a small door weighs a lot less than a giant door. Yeah, yeah. I, the simplest sensor we could come up with for yeah. one so. I feel like it's, it's just bagging this to have go like... go wrong, to be clear. <laughs> yeah. Like, if the mechanisms inside jam up, uh, that will be pretty embarrassing. Right, right, right. Um, but it, it looks like it's just begging to have like two big googly eyes with a with a funny looking grin there, you know, or something. Yeah. So we, we are we are uh, incurring some complexity for the, the, the sort of the racking system inside, because you've got to have a racking system uh, so it's, it like, it's more complicated than a Pez dispenser, <laughs> but it's the general principle is Is, is it similar. like spring loaded then or hydraulically loaded or something or? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bunch of electric, it's, it, it's, a, it's electric uh, and with, with, a, with a bunch of mechanisms. Um, and they just like roll themselves out and just zip out the door and... <laughs> Sorry. It's inspired um, by pallet stacking technology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like I watch YouTube videos of a pallet stacker. Yeah, gotcha. exactly. Gotcha. In, in, industrial pallet stackers is the same basic principle. Cool. Um, they they don't look super simple, Frank, but but uh, but they do work. Right. Um, and so it's just, it's the same basic mechanism. I mean, there's some risk of uh, you know you're loading it in at uh, you know one G and then you're unloading it at zero G. So, you know, you could have some uh, situation where you're unloading a mechanism and because you unload the mechanism, it now binds. Right. Like, so that's a risk that we, that's hard to test for. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, what, so this, so you're planning to actually do your first set of Starlink version twos on this vehicle or, wait, is this 25 or 24? 24. This is 24, which is, currently scheduled-ish to be the first orbital attempt, right? So you are, so has the plan changed to go from kind of a suborbital to a, an orbital launch if you're gonna be trying to pop out a couple Starlinks? No, we're, we're always gonna go, our next launch uh, is always gonna be orbital. Is it full orbital, not? Yes. Okay, so so that would. Well, yes, I mean, yes, uh, or full orbital. Because okay. for a little while there was talk about like B4 and stuff and S20 back in the day doing like a, just shy of orbit, you know, on the re-entry by Hawaii and stuff like that, never quite reaching. It's 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 still it's basically orbit. Okay, yeah. yeah. There's, there's no real difference. Mouse fart between the. It, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you could just. It's the difference between. I mean, you're going like three quarters of the way around the Earth. Uh, you're, yeah. I mean, you. Well, it's could, literally like thirty meters per second difference. Or something it's tiny. Of, it's hilariously small. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's extremely. T the, 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 yeah. It's it's essentially orbital velocity. Yeah. So, um, there's just no point in doing. Like why not? Why do an extra loop around the Earth, you know, and and uh, have another the orbit burn? So, um, but if you're but, 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 but really the, like, I I wouldn't say that there's like high confidence that the first flight will work. I think there's a good chance that it does not reach orbit, that there's an issue with the booster or or stage separation or with the ship doesn't start or, and then even if it does get to orbit, there's. The probability that the ship makes it down intact is also not super high. Right. Uh, this is why it's entering over the Pacific, an unpopulated area. Um, so if, if there is an issue, uh, it's not a danger to people. Yep. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people were asking about after, or, you know, once we started seeing the, the heat shield tiles, is why they aren't scaled like a dragon or like like a roof shingle where they're slightly overlapping and tapering and and thickness, you know, uh, why are they just uh, have the gaps and everything? What's? Um, I mean, you know, there's there's more than there's, there's multiple ways to approach this. So it's not that like a shingled approach uh, couldn't work. You could have a shingled approach. Um, 
the, the thing that will happen or, or, or should in theory happen here is that when the tiles get hot, they will expand and, t and tighten the gap. So the gaps that you see here should be smaller uh, when the tiles heat up. Um, and you know, you're, it's, you're really not gonna see a lot of heat going down through those gaps is, is our expectation. So um, shingling does not seem to be important. Uh, we could be wrong so, about so that. So it's going kind of around the vehicle as yeah. opposed to trying to burrow into it. Right, right. Yeah, the flow is not coming straight in at those gaps. So it's like... It's, yeah. I mean, we'll be coming in at an angle similar to the shuttle, like, I don't know, 60, 70 degrees. Uh, so it's sort of like if, if the if the ground is the surface of the earth, we're, we're sort of coming in like that. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a balance between um, generating lift. Like, we, 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 for a reusable heat shield, we want to minimize the peak heat load. Yeah. So the peak heat load is going to determine uh, if we melt the tiles or not. Yeah. And if you melt the tiles, that they're not very good for reuse. Right. So, so we're... Um, kind of balancing between generating lift uh, and yeah, so there's atmospheric density, velocity, and, and you don't want to have like, uh, be, high, be going fast in, in high density air. That's going to be... You want to kind of stay up in the upper atmosphere for a little bit longer than you would with... Uh... You want to slow down as much as possible in, in, the, in the thin uh, upper atmosphere. Yeah. So you you minimize peak heating. Which that's the, that's much, the goal. Minimize yeah, peak heating. Which is pretty much what designed the whole shuttle's airframe almost was that that peak heating and the, yeah. and the controlling that peak that PQ. Yes. So now we're going to learn a lot from this first uh, entry. Um, and like I said, this if there's any issues, uh, the ship will not. You know, if, if there's unexpected heating in some places, then the ship will fail on entry, and that'll be that. Yeah. Is there any talks? Uh, speaking of failing and, and re-entry and all those things, uh, have you guys? There were rumblings for a little bit that you guys, someone was talking about flying ship twenty still or S twenty, just on a uh, suborbital. Yeah, we've moved on. Oh, just for, <laughs> for my sake, man. Those. Those suborbital flights were so fun to watch because it was so slow. You got to feel it, you know, that much longer when it's just sitting there, you know, ascending for several minutes. Like, I've never seen anything like yeah, those that. Those flights are cool. Um, but like this, we, we, we think we've learned, you know, what we needed to learn really with the suborbital flights. Yeah. And there, there wasn't really much to learn. So best to focus on getting to orbit. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, yay, but also, uh, <laughs> I can't, that, quite excited about the, yeah, that's true. Those yeah, those, yeah, those 33 Raptors, I think we'll put on a pretty, that'll make up for the slow, uh, yeah. slow, gentle climb will be 33 shaking everything. I think <laughs> what will seem kind of pretty, pretty odd or like strange is that, uh, is this, this, the Starship orbital stack is going to come off the pad very fast. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's got a high thrust weight. What's its thrust, approximate thrust of weight? I mean, it should be like 1.4-ish, maybe 1.5. Around 1.5. Yeah. That's like Ariane 5 speeds with those SRBs. Once that, those light, that thing just shot off, shoots off the pad, you know? And Yeah. That'll uh, be like that. I mean, it's, yeah. That'll be um, disorienting to see something that big, just accelerating that quickly, you know? It'll... For a reusable vehicle, uh, you actually want to have a higher thrust to weight than an expendable vehicle. Um, because th uh, th thrust weight below one is not doing anything. Yep. So your propellant is not being useful below thrust weight of one. So you actually want to have a higher thrust weight for uh, a, a reusable vehicle than for an expendable. Yep. Um, for an expendable vehicle, the, 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 the cost overwhelmingly is in the vehicle itself that you are losing. Yes. Um, but for a reusable vehicle, it, it, if it's you know, rapidly reusable and completely reusable, the cost of propellant is uh, the, the single biggest cost of the flight. And so you want to have a high thrust to weight so that um, so more of the thrust is useful. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, high thrust to weight ratio literally is is financially beneficial purely on the, on the you need yeah. less fuel to do the same amount so, of work. Like, like, like this may sound sort of mercantile, but it's actually the, the, the thing to optimize for is cost per ton to orbit. 
um, be, 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 like you can't cheat if, if you get cost per ton to orbit. Uh, it's it's not it's not about what the uh, mass ratio is or the ISP or anything. So although we're aiming for you know to have a great mass ratio, great ISP, everything. Um, but it's really what is your fully considered cost per ton to orbit. At the end of the day, yes. Yeah. Fully considered cost per ton to orbit is the optimization. Yeah. And any given technology is only relevant to the degree that it produces cost per ton to orbit. So um, thrust to weight ratio might matter more than ISP as long as it makes yeah. for a lower cost per ton to orbit. Yes. So the trade-offs always end up with, does it decrease the cost per ton to orbit? And that's what matters more. Aspirationally, like, we don't always get it right, but the, the, the thing that really matters is minimize cost per ton to orbit. Uh, and then for Mars or the Moon, minimize cost per ton to the surface of the Moon or to the surface of Mars. Yeah. Uh, and just to give you a sense of, of just how much we need to improve it, uh, it's really insane. Um, like right now, the, the, the cost uh, per, per useful landed ton to the surface of Mars is in excess of a billion dollars. Uh, so you, you can't count the heat shield or the parachute or the useful stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the landing system's mass does not count. Yep. Only the, like in the case of the the uh, the rovers, it's really just the rover yep. that is the useful thing. Yep. So if the rover weighs a ton, yep. then. Uh, and it costs a billion dollars to get there. It's a billion dollars per ton yeah. to Mars. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's roughly, you know, uh, what, what it currently costs. Now, in order to make life multi-planetary and have a self-sustaining city on Mars, uh, that number will have to improve to, I think, probably under a hundred thousand dollars a ton. That that would be a, t a ten thousand times better than the current state of the art. To yeah. put things into perspective, how much of an improvement is needed? Not ten thousand percent, ten thousand fold. <laughs> That's what Starship is intended to do: be ten thousand times better than the current state of the art. So, orders and orders and orders of magnitude. It's a lot of orders of magnitude. Uh, but it is, uh, we're not breaking any laws of physics. Uh, it is possible to do that. Yeah. Should we, uh, can we see up at the top or is there anything to see up there right now? Uh, not really anything to see. I mean, I, uh, I think we, we probably shouldn't take pictures of the inside. Uh, not that it's super interesting, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think we got to be cautious about like pictures of the inside and stuff. Where's the lifting points on on this one now? Uh, right. You can see the lugs up there. Uh, I mean, I'm not. So I, those, we need to move those lifting points. Those are not in a good position. <laughs> so you don't want to have lifting points where the heat shield tiles are. We, we need to move the lift points to uh, where the heat shield tiles are not. Are you still hoping to, to catch the ship too with, with the arms or what's the, I mean, you are, right? Yeah. How, how, how are you going to catch it, I guess? Like, <laughs> are you going to do the same thing with the tiny little nubs? Like like the booster? Uh, yeah, I mean it's, it'll be very similar to the booster. With uh, now in the case of the ship, uh, because we need to have heat shield tiles that go more than 180 degrees, a little more than 180 degrees, um, we'll have to have the, uh, the the catch points kind of like flip out. Oh, cool. Um, but it'll otherwise so be it stays in the in the lead. It's got to be the lead, then. lead of the wind. Um, like you either have to, I mean, there's you either have to have a, have a pot with heat shield tiles pop out, or have something that's in the leeward side that that swings out yeah. one of the two and you can't just have the you can't catch them by the, the the nose fins uh you well sort of could um well like what you're seeing there that doesn't have heat shield tiles will need to have heat shield tiles yeah yeah so 
everything's going to have heat shield tiles. That just you see a, like a steel part at the base yeah. of the, but that'll have to have tiles on it. What if it's so. if it's attached? If the mounting point would be attached to somewhere on the leeward side of the of the flap, and the flap could rotate more than 180 degrees, it could get in line with this. It could be the same mechanism that does the quickie thing. Could be just the flap itself. Um, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying, but if if the if the uh, the catch ball thing is on the leeward side of the flap, and the flap can go beyond 180 degrees. Oh, that's man. We're talking that's, high not, that's not the problem you want us to try to solve. The like a huge challenge we have is the the hot gas seal. Um, oh which, right, you'd move that. Yeah, even you, more you don't want to that. over over center that. Yes. Uh, if like frankly, the the thing we need to do, I think, is move the forward flaps uh, more towards the leeward side. Uh, this is a major internal debate, but Get them more the, the, out the, of the, the... there's a there's a massive amount of optimization possible with the forward flaps. Um, they're, they're they're in the wrong position. They're, they're the wrong size, wrong position, wrong, wrong location. Um, but they're they will work. Yeah, they're a start. <laughs> yeah, they'll they'll work, but they're far from optimal. Uh, what are the under those one heat shields? Do you see the little those like yellow puck things? What are those? In, are those special or something? Uh, just like temperature sensors. Oh, cool. oh, oh uh, either, uh, I think so. Either temperature or ra uh, radio. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So either the antennas or uh, temperature sensors. Cool. Sensors. Um, well, what else is new since last time we were out here? Um, well, we're we're building the the mega bay. Got your gears turning now. No, yeah, just there's a. I mean, there's a lot of improvements to make with the ship, ship and booster design. Um, but anyway, right now the important thing is just to get to orbit with, um, you know, some reasonable payload, and then uh, we have a whole series of improvements that we plan to improve the performance, of the payload to orbit. Um, so. Um, but I, I really am not a fan of our forward flaps. They're, like every time I look at them, it drives me crazy because they're, they're so suboptimal. Um, well, at your rate of innovation and your rate of iteration, those will be <laughs> different sooner rather than later, I'm sure. Yeah, the, I mean, it's, there's a, a potential scenario where we can delete the forward flaps entirely. And the oh, shuttle, the shuttle doesn't have forward flaps. Right. So. And that's because you're using dihedral control to control mostly pitch, and you can still do a little bit of yaw and roll with just a, a pair. So, huh. Because um, it's mostly about your center of pressure, right? So, if, so you Center can, of mass and center of pressure. It's a seesaw. Uh, so you can just think of uh, these things like the You've, you've got a seesaw uh, and um, your center, of, it's, it's like uh, your center of pressure, like the winds, the, 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 the air is, is, is hitting the vehicle uh, and the, the, you, you have a center of pressure. It's like, wh wh where's the, wh where, where, wh where's that air gonna push the vehicle? Yeah. Like what's, where, if, if you add up all the wind pressure, yeah. What's the where if you're like pushing it with your finger? Where would you where would the what's the center of that force going to yep. be? Yep. Uh, and then you've got your center of mass, which is a similar thing but for mass. Um, so you've got like you've got these sort of two seesaw things: center of pressure, center of mass. Um, 
if you have big forward flaps and big rear flaps, you can have um, a much more variation in where your center of mass is going to be. Um, and also what your angle of attack can be and how you, well you can control the vehicle in different uh, Mach regimes uh, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the face of like he, he, uh, a lot of wind shear, wind buffet. Mm -hmm. um, so well, because there was that, uh, again, Soviet, like, uh, I don't remember what it was called, the, the mole or something that just had a, a di dihedral wing on the back. Uh, it was supposed to be like a mini shuttle for them, uh, like a two passenger the shuttle. Baron, you mean? What was that? The Baron? No, not oh. Baron. No, um, it, it had a like it's it had foldable wings, and they basically the only thing is those those are fixed. They weren't dynamic, you know. So it's not like they uh, controlled its pitch, but it basically had a really it was supposed to have a really high angle of attack during initial ascent, and then the 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 back flaps just folded down, and but that was to extend basically have actual lift and and do a, a horizontal landing. It wasn't necessarily like a dynamic link, but yeah. the idea was that you could control your overall, you know, pitch almost like you know Virgin Galactics. Uh, spaceship two that folds in half, you know, how it can change its its whole center pressure and everything uh, just, you know, in, in a, a single thing. But it's not again, that's not dynamic. It goes from one mode to mode one to mode two, you know, and same with that, that Soviet one. But yeah, there's, you know, that probably becomes a lot trickier when you are trying to be dynamic and when you are trying to actually pinpoint control your landing. I'm sure that with just yeah. having a... Um, I, the thing that's like really counterintuitive about the Starship is that it's not an aircraft, it's falling. Yeah. So uh, we're just constantly trying to break as yeah. opposed to an aircraft that is, an aircraft is trying to generate lift um, and fly horizontally. We are trying to generate drag and uh, it be as draggy as possible when we, when we fall. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a very different optimization than an aircraft. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about about four times the usable area of the, the high bay. Um, so it's only a little bit taller, but it's a lot wider and deeper. And so uh, we, we have a, a lot more uh, positions for product, manufacturing the booster or the ship. Yeah. So if you, if you have a production line, you need a lot of stations, essentially, yeah. for uh, high production. So this is intended to have a lot of stations. Is some of this getting replaced by another building that's like over top of some stuff? Or is uh, it? Well, we are building a permanent building, a permanent factory building and replacing the tents. Okay. Um, but the high bays and the mid we're bay. Not building the... A, we're not building <laughs> a building to encompass the high bay. That would be insane. Uh, but we are, we are going to be building a factory, a permanent factory building and replacing the tents. So, and we start the factory building from that side and, and kind of build and gradually replace the tents okay. with, a, with, a, with a large permanent building. Okay. And that's actually currently in the works, I guess. So you're still, you know, there's a lot of speculation, obviously, with how quickly Florida is ramping up that this might be slowing down, but that doesn't seem to be slowing down too much if you're no. building a building out here. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, by the way, I'm, I am Hi. Tim. Hi. Hey, Andy nice Krebs. to meet you. Awesome. Yeah, sorry, what was your name? Andy Krebs. Okay, cool. I cool. do engineering for the non flight hardware. So I, I do the high bays and the factory. I'm responsible for those as well as the launch pad. Cool. Stage zero. A lot of the stage zero stuff. Yeah. Uh, the, the ground systems are, uh, ground systems, especially inclusive of the tower, are at least as complicated as the, as, as the stage one or stage two. Yeah, yeah. So. Should we go check out uh, stage zero? Uh, sure. <laughs> thank you, Elon, for all your generous time. And thank you, Ryan Chalinski, for helping shoot and capture this incredible conversation. And I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make videos like this possible. If you want to help me continue to do what I do, head on over to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out our awesome merchandise shop where you can find shirts like this, the RD171 shirt, and lots of other really cool stuff at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.